All right, we've got people trickling in. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for being here. For those who are joining, uh, maybe you could go ahead and drop in the chat where you're joining us from, uh, what you're interested in learning tonight. We really want to do our best to get to know who's in the audience. And if for any reason you all cannot access the chat because that has been a problem in the past, uh, please go ahead and let us know in the Q&A. And for the panelists who are joining us, you can take a look at the participant list. And if you notice any names, I encourage you to say hello. Nice, we have Patty from Glen Ellen. As a little icebreaker, maybe uh, I can pose a question to our panelists and see uh, what are you all excited to be here for? What are you excited to educate our audience on? Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm always, I, I, I really enjoy actually creating these web, these webinars because I always learn things and um, you'll see in my slides some information that I just discovered, you know, in the process of making them in the last couple of days. But, you know, my subject matter is all about ecology and biodiversity. So that's, that's always thrilling to me. <laughs> Hope you guys find it just as interesting. I think I enjoy just having that captive audience that wants to get educated on how we can um, look at where we live, what we do, how we do it, and um, just, you know, take responsibility for, um, you know, the fact that we are, you know, some of us are living in the wildland urban interface and how do we do that responsibly and, and how, do we, how do we survive and thrive in this kind of environment. I noticed Nancy Shepard is on and she just came out of a presentation that uh, that uh, Roberta McIntyre made that I participated oh. in. So gosh, I hope you're not, I, I hope you, I think they'll, you'll find new information here. I hope you do. Thanks for joining us, Nancy. It looks like Nancy uh, is looking to recreate her garden space with something that is going to be more fire safe and she lives in the Oak Woodlands. Thanks, Nancy. Nice. We have participants from Sebastopol, Sacramento, Pengrove, Katani, Petaluma area. Oh, Ashland, Oregon. Wow, cool. Sharice, <laughs> hey Sharice. <laughs> I know her. She's small world, Oregon. or she's in Ashland, Oregon. Yeah, small world. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we did a. Um, a workshop, a post-fire um, soil considerations workshop a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we had participants from Oregon and Washington. And I feel like uh, with this year's fires, we're, we're all in it together on the West Coast. So really glad to, to you know, connect up with our Northern state friends and I'll be better prepared. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you all so much for being here. And again, I don't think I can express enough gratitude to our panelists. So thank you so much. And I think whenever folks are feeling ready to get started, we're about five minutes in and I'm sure people will trickle in throughout the webinar, um, but maybe we can go ahead out of respect for everybody's time. So welcome everybody to Wildfires and Ecology, How to Create Defensible Space. This event is in collaboration with the Resilient Landscape Coalition, represented by the Habitat Corridor Project, Sonoma Ecology Center, and the UC Master Gardeners. We also have special guests from the Sonoma County Fire District. And as always, we'd like to thank our sponsors, especially the Town of Windsor for making this event possible tonight. My name is Annie Silverman. I'm a senior programs coordinator at Daily Axe, and I'm joined by Liz here, who's doing a lot of the behind the scenes, and you'll hear her voice chip in and answer some questions as well. 
Our mission is to inspire transformative action that creates connected, equitable, and climate resilient communities. We do this through strengthening community leaders to build public and political will to spread solutions and models throughout our community. Our actions ripple far and wide because of people like you taking action in your daily life. In the words of Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Before we get going, I'll go over some Zoom etiquette here. If you have any questions, please use the question and answer box. This will help us track your questions and make sure that they all get answered. We'll answer some of your questions during the transitions. And don't worry, there's always time for question and answer at the end. Uh, all of our events, when they used to be face-to-face, -face, they were all about creating connections. And Zoom, we're still about creating connections. So if you see somebody you know, or you wanna have a conversation or say hi to somebody, please use that chat box and create that sense of community. So I'd like to start with introducing Ellie Inslee, who is going to be our first speaker. And then she will go ahead and introduce the rest of the speakers. And we're also joined by um, Cindy Foreman and Jeff Lemelin, who will be answering questions during that question and answer time for any questions that are outside the scope of the coalition. So without further ado, Ellie, you can take it away. Thank you. So I'll share my screen here in a second. How's that look? You guys see everything? Hello, hello. You see my screen? Yep, looks good. Okay, good. I can, you know, it's just an act of faith, right? <laughs> so, um, thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Liz and Annie at Daily Acts for inviting us in, and Cindy and Jeff for joining us also. Um, I'm Ellie Inslee. I'm a landscape architect with a specialty in natural habitat restoration, and I'm also a board member at the Sonoma Ecology Center. And I'm really happy to be the first of three panelists on the subject of firewise and sustainable landscaping. The theme is garden as if life depends on it, referring to the importance of protecting human life by maintaining the defensible space area around your home, but also taking care of the wildlife and habitat that we all share. So briefly about the Sonoma Ecology Center, our mission is to work with our community to identify and lead actions that achieve and sustain ecological health in the Sonoma Valley, but also more broadly in the County of Sonoma and further. After the fires of 2017, the Ecology Center began leading fire recovery walks into the burned landscapes in Sonoma Valley to help ourselves and others witness the resilience of the natural landscape and be heartened and inspired by it. Many people were understandably traumatized and we met some who had overzealously cleared most of the vegetation within their 100 feet, under 100 feet of their homes and further, unintentionally causing problems of erosion, growth of weeds that are highly flammable and loss of wildlife habitat. We knew of others who hesitated to do anything because they'd nurtured their landscape for years and didn't know how to preserve it while making it more defensible. And in most cases, it seemed like people were confused. So our aim, has become to help people create defensible space that's beautiful, sustainable, and biodiverse. And in this picture here, as an example, we have a native herbaceous perennial called coral bells, which can grow in the shade under oaks and provides food and shelter for birds and nesting areas. So it's an example of the kind of landscape we hope to help you create that's both firewise and beautiful and biodiverse. So our team, the Resilient Landscape Coalition was formed about 18 months ago when members of three organizations joined together to provide education and resources to help landowners with their defensible space. Um, at the Sonoma Ecology Center, I'm joined by Jason Mills, who's the, restorations, the restoration project manager, and Caitlin Cornwall. Um, UC Cooperative Extension, is our partner is Mimi Enright. She's the program manager and one of her cohort folks is Cleo Tarazi, who's the board president. And then April Owens from the Habitat Corridor Project. She's the executive director of that nonprofit. 
And she's also the chair of the horticulture program at, of the local Native Plant Society, and she has her own landscaping business. So this team has spent countless hours in partnership with FireSafe Sonoma, Roberta McIntyre, and the Sonoma County Fire Prevention Division, Chief Williams and Carleone Safford. And it's been an honor to work with the fire agency folks as we vet our content through their lens, the whole time learning a tremendous amount from each other. We tend to come from different perspectives than fire professionals. When an ecologist sees a group of bushes, for instance, with a tree nearby, we see food and shelter for wildlife. While a firefighter sees it, they may see a potential burning bush and possible ladder fuels leading to a crown fire. It's really important we've learned to see both perspectives. So as an overview, this is, I'm doing this 20 minutes, talk a little bit about regulations, the wildland urban interface and ecology and sustainability. And then Mimi will be talking about design and maintenance principles and April will be talking and presenting slides about landscape design and lots of examples about what your garden can look like. So I'm gonna just run quickly through some regulations. It's the landowner's responsibility to be familiar with state and county regulations as well as federal regulations before doing a lot of vegetation management. And in the defensible space, there are two main sets of regulations to be aware of. And they really are one because one actually follows the other. There's the State uh, Public Resources Code 4291, which covers the state responsibility area, and also the Sonoma County Ordinance Chapter 13A, which covers the local responsibility area, but it's actually based on what the state's code is. They're very similar with the county ordinance um, perhaps being a little bit more specific. And Mimi's gonna highlight the, uh, these codes um, in her presentation. So if you live along a creek or a <laughs> adjacent to a wildland area, it's important to be aware of other government regulations before you do any vegetation modification. The county has a riparian corridor combining zone that covers the area next to the creek, state fish and wildlife, and the Regional Water Quality Control Board to protect wildlife and water quality, and federal agencies like the Army Corps of Engineers and Fish and Wildlife also protect the same resources. So I'm going to get into some maps. I love maps. I hope you guys do too. Um, this is a map of the fire hazard severity zones in Sonoma County, and those color coded, the one in red is the highest hazard area. And it's maybe a little um, hard to read, but the bright red area actually follows the ridge line along the Mayakamas range and then down into Sonoma Valley. So to the right, let me see if my pointer's working. Yeah, so, so this is actually the county line between Napa and Sonoma. And, um, and then the, the gray blobs are, this is the, the city of Santa Rosa and then um, Runner Park and Petaluma. So you can see, um, and the, the fires that we've had in the last three years actually verify that the high fire zones are along the Mayacamas and down, flowing down into Santa Rosa. But there's also quite a bit of uh, high fire hazard in West County. And the reason that that's interesting is the state has come up with new codes and that, that um, restrict or that, that guide how you build your houses, but also what you do in the defensible space zone. And I think it's new enough that we don't have too much information, but um, the only thing I know that may be different in defensible space is the need for being super careful in the zero to five zone. Um, here's another kind of cool map showing the wildfires from 2015 through 2020, and this expands into Napa County. So uh, here's the ridge line between Sonoma and Napa. The dark purple is the glass fire that we just had. The lighter purple are the LNU complex fires. This is over in Napa around Lake Berryessa. And um, the yellow were the 2017 fires, and then this rose color one is the Kincaid fire. So um, one thing that's interesting to think about is prior to colonization and subsequent fire suppression, 
wildfires in California burned an average of 4 million acres each year, according to one study. Some were ignited by lightning, but most were intentionally set by Native Americans to encourage growth of plants they valued for food and fiber, and also to aid in hunting. 4 million acres is equivalent to the current record setting season of fires we've had this year in 2020. Some studies say as many as 13 million acres burned on average yearly, or maybe not on average, but at the most, which is three times what we've experienced this year. And those fires back pre-historically or, or pre-colonization were likely much lower intensity and so therefore less smoke. But um, you can imagine that the, the summer skies were pretty smoky back in the day. So here we have an image of the, um, and a sort of discussion of the wildland urban interface. It's defined as an area where homes and associated structures are built among or adjacent to forest shrubs or grasslands. And interestingly, the I in WUI can refer to the wildland urban interface, which is where the wildland abuts pretty cleanly with an urban or suburban area, or the wildland urban intermix, where you have rural home developments in among the wildland. So um, climate change plus fire suppression and uh, increased development in the wildland urban interface results in increased fire, work, fire risk. So when houses are built close to or within forests or other types of natural vegetation, a number of problems occur. There naturally be more, will be more wildfires <laughs> due to human ignitions, usually unintentional, wildfires that occur will pose a greater risk to lives and homes because of the greater number of people there. They'll be harder to fight for the very same reason, the amount of people. And letting natural fires burn in the wildland urban interface isn't possible. So fire suppression remains necessary in those areas. These two maps show an expansion of development into the wildlands between 1964 and 2017, the left slide shows the Hanley fire and the right slide shows the Tubbs fire. The pink area shows the area of those fires. The outline shows the, the area of those fires. And you can see that this is um, a zone that has burned and this isn't the only time, the only two times they've burned. So just for orientation, the red blotch to the lower left is the city of Santa Rosa and the red line going up to the north is the 101 corridor. And the tan area in both maps is low density housing. So you can see how people have moved into the fire prone area in the last 45 years with all the attendant problems I mentioned earlier. And the added problem that wildlife habitat is fragmented, making it difficult for many plant and animal species, and in fact, the entire ecological system to thrive. So many say we need to avoid building in the wildland urban interface, but regardless, now that we're here, it's our responsibility to take care of the land and our neighbors, um, human and wildlife. So taking care of our neighbors, since we've in a very real sense displaced species by moving in, um, we have an important role to play supporting ecosystem services. And Doug Tallamy, who's a wonderful entomologist or insect scientist. And I recommend reading all his books and looking them up on the internet. He's the author of a book called Bringing Nature Home, which promotes the idea of making our gardens into habitat oases. He opens the book Bringing Nature Home with the statement, for the first time in history, gardeners become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. So our gardens can provide crucial ecosystem services. And before I leave this slide, I'll point out that that's butterfly is called the painted lady and it's on coyote mint, which is a beautiful herbaceous ground cover. And there's a Bewix wren and also a squirrel, obviously. So these garden ecosystem services that uh, we can actually help our gardens supporting biodiversity enriching soil and holding it in place, cleaning and managing water, uh, slow it, sink it, spread it, store it. We can all do all of those things, including sequestering carbon 
and supporting pollinators and all the while enhancing defensible space. So the question of the biodiversity is defined as the web of life above and below ground, including the plants, animals, fungi, and micro microorganisms. In 2017, a German study reported a decline of more than 75% in insect biomass across a large number of nature areas in Germany between 1989 and 2016. And many of you are familiar with the continuing drop in monarch butterflies with less than 3% of the 1980 numbers. Anecdotal evidence from Australia last year indicates insect declines there as well. But insects are the foundation of many life systems. They pollinate a spectrum of plants, including many of those that humans rely on for food. They're also key players in other important jobs, including breaking down dead things into the building blocks of new life. And these declines are due to habitat loss and degradation from development, climate changing too fast for adaptation and widespread use of pesticides and um, invasive plant species, and interestingly, also light pollution. So how do we support biodiversity? Choose native plants, and April's gonna talk about that, but they improve biodiversity by providing food for wildlife. And it's surprising but true, insects do specialize on specific plants and can't survive or reproduce without them. And, um, Oh, and I'll get to the plant for islands for wildlife, but that's a pipe vine swallowtail, which lays its eggs on the pipe vine plant and caterpillars are, they, that's the only place that they can actually grow and eat before they turn, before they turn into butterflies. So it's important to plant islands for wildlife food and shelter, use integrated pest management and provide a water source. Um, another way to support biodiversity is to take good care of oak trees. And this is a photo of an oak woodland with an understory of coral bells, similar to the, the plant I showed you earlier, but this one is white. It's drought tolerant and won't damage the root system of the oak tree. Oaks are incredibly productive food factories for wildlife. They provide acorns and host the insects and caterpillars that support many of our favorite garden birds, such as quail, bluebirds, robins, orioles, and acorn woodpeckers. Many insect species feed on the leaves, twigs, bark, and wood of oaks, so we wanna keep them healthy, also because a declining tree can be very fire prone. And this, of course, is true of all plants. So it's important to protect the root system, including minimizing any irrigation, compaction, or digging within the drip line or beyond where possible. And equally important, keep a couple of inches of leaf litter on the ground, which feed the microorganisms in the root system. So back to the subject of garden ecosystem services, if the, uh, your garden can hold soil in place if well managed and it keeps the creeks clean for fish. So with maintenance, please avoid over clearing. In this picture, the soil is devoid of vegetation, causing erosion, eliminating wildlife habitat, and just asking for invasive fire prone plants to invade. Um, so you need to protect the soil, the streams and the fish by keeping vegetation on the land. Um, another critical garden ecosystem service is carbon sequestration. And anyone who's seen the movie Kiss the Ground will know what I'm talking about here. So as plants photosynthesize, they draw CO2 from the air along with water and nutrients from the soil to produce plant materials both above and below ground, therefore sequestering carbon in the plant material and in the soil. And it's an interesting statistic that soils are capable of holding more carbon dioxide than the atmosphere or above ground animal and plant life combined. So it's an incredibly underutilized resource. To sequester carbon efficiently, a plant a tree, a shrub, or grass must have a robust set of microorganisms underground. So keeping the soil healthy is incredibly important. So just a couple more points about maintenance and then I'll turn it over to Mimi. Timing is everything. When you are doing any sort of substantial vegetation management, it's important to do it when birds aren't nesting 
they nest between March and August. So the best time to actually do vegetation management of any substance so as not to disturb birds is in the late summer and winter. So September through February. And even though this may not seem like a subject related to defensible space, it's important to mention nevertheless, light pollution is a significant issue in the context of biodiversity. This oak tree is a beautiful plant and some might be inclined to highlight it, but it's very hard for an insect, a caterpillar or a bird to use this particular tree. While insects aren't really well studied, it's thought that half of the millions of insect species are nocturnal and would be unable to locate food or mates with this kind of artificial lighting. Those active in the day may also be disturbed by the light at night when they're at rest. So it's best to turn them off or use motion activated lighting. And the inset photo in the lower left is a picture of our native firefly, also known as the glowworm, even though it's actually a beetle. Most people don't even know that we have them. The female doesn't fly, but emits a faint light for the male who does fly to find her. And it would be a difficult project to do in a night lit environment. So just with that, I'll turn it over to Mimi. These are two of my favorite species. I call the, the quail the, uh, the um, charismatic mag microfauna, or like we could call it megafauna for California, and um, the pipevine swallowtail on some, some beautiful Cleveland sedge. So with that, I can turn it over to Mimi. Great. Thank you, Allie. Let me do a little transition with my screen share. So uh, let me just do a little management there. So are you seeing the first slide of my presentation? Excellent. So um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mimi Enright, and I work at UC Cooperative Extension here in Sonoma County. And I'm the program coordinator for the UC Master Gardener program. I've been with the program for over seven years. I actually did the training myself uh, about nine years ago. And um, hopefully many of you are familiar with Master Gardeners and who we are and what we do. Uh, we are trained agents of the University of California, and our mission is to extend the educational outreach of the university, um, our land-grant university, to our community. And in particular, we do that with a focus on sustainable landscape principles as our core message. And um, really at the heart of the Resilient Landscape Coalition was what we saw as a need to marry um, the sustainable landscaping principles that Ellie just did such a, a beautifully eloquent job of sharing with you why those are so important with the principles of defensible space. Um, and um, we're, we hope to achieve that through our presentation and um, hope it's um, of value to you today. Um, so I want to just stress that we're really hoping to provide some clarity and simplicity to the vast volume of existing information on the topic of defensible space. This is not meant as prescriptive mandates, but really as guidelines for each individual homeowner for decision making on their own properties. Um, and we feel, um, uh, as I, I'm sure our fire officials do as well, that each of us need to be making decisions to be better prepared as we move ahead. And we're hoping that this presentation gives you some guidelines to do that. I've got a lot of material to cover. Sorry, it's 45 minutes. I know that's a long stretch. So um, hang in with me. I'm gonna speed through it pretty quickly because we have a short time frame to cover all this. Um, but uh, I'm basically gonna do a quick touch, very basic touch on fire basics. Then move into um, designing for fire and plant selection considerations. Then discuss how to design your home landscape with fire in mind based on the different zones in the zero to 100 foot defensible space zone around your home. A uh, quick touch on mulch uh, and then ongoing maintenance, which really is one of the most important aspects to continuing to keep our properties as ready as we can before the next fire. All right, so let's dive in. Um, so I'm not going to, as I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on fire and how it operates. You know, frankly, I think that's really the bailiwick of our firefighting personnel. They're much more knowledgeable about all that. Um, but I do want to cover a few basics, which I think are important to the context of our conversation today. So um, basically, fire must have three elements in order to burn. And those are fuel, oxygen, and heat. Um, and certainly as we've become uh, much too familiar here in Sonoma County and on much of the West Coast, 
fire behavior is, in, is influenced by the fuel that's available, the weather and the topography. Um, fuel is basically anything that will burn. It's just that basic. And for us in home landscapes, that can mean our vegetation, landscape mulch, fencing, roofing, decks, lawn furniture, arbors, trellises, planter boxes, et cetera, et cetera. And fuel is the element that we have control over. So there are three threats or exposures that a building can experience during wildfire. Um, and those are um, direct flame as depicted in this top graphic um, by radiant heat or from embers. Um, and as we are all unfortunately so familiar with now, uh, embers under wildfire conditions are um, persistent and very unpredictable. And they have a way of finding the weakness in a home. Um, in fact, most building ignitions have been uh, attributed to embers. They can ignite building components and context, contents directly or ignite vegetation and other combustible items adjacent to or near a building, which can then result in a radiant heat or direct flame contact exposure. So today, uh, as I mentioned, we're focusing on the 100 feet, the, what's called the defensible space zone surrounding your home. And this concept of this home ignition zone was developed by USDA Forest Service fire scientists, Jack Cohan in the late 1990s following some breakthrough experimental research into how homes ignite due to the effect of radiant heat. And since then, wildfire safety recommendations have been shaped by this fire science. And because of it, we're able to provide the actionable guidance for homeowners to help them prepare their home and home landscapes uh, to resist wildfire. So it's important to consider what your goals are in preparing for the next fire. Certainly we wanna slow the fire and reduce the possibility of it catching your house on fire. But it's also important to ensure there's an exit plan for you and your family. And it's just as important to ensure that there's appropriate access for firefighters coming in to defend your home for their safety. So here's the bottom line. What you do to prepare your home and landscape for the next fire matters. We know the truths um, in this slide and in this presentation and your actions to prepare are really key. Uh, and we all know how hard our firefighters have worked to, to protect our home and communities. We're deeply grateful for their service. But given the scope of the wildfires we have seen and experienced, um, we also know we can't assume that there will be a shiny red truck at your home when the fire comes. So attending this workshop is a great first step, um, but action and even little things are critical for moving forward to make your um, home and home landscape better prepared as we move forward. Okay, so the, um, the most important, one of the most important messages I hope you take out of this, even though we're here to talk to you about your, your landscape and the defensible space around your home, uh, is that step one is to start at your house and work out from there. Um, we're not, we don't go into the topic of home hardening in our, um, in our uh, presentation, our focus is on the landscape, but there are many wonderful resources to help guide you through the home hardening process. But here are the different defensible space zones. Uh, let me see if my action, sorry, if my action is going to work. I'm having a little problem with my um, slideshow presentation, so I'm not sure if my, my zones are going to work. Um, we're going to start in the, um, the zero to five foot zone around the perimeter of the house, then move out to the five to 30 foot zone, and then wrap up um, uh, in the defensible space zone of 30 to 100 feet. So these are our basic principles for creating a firewise and sustainable landscape. Um, and resilient garden design is, is more about plant selection and placement uh, and the overall garden design with hardscape elements and maintenance. Maintenance is key. And of course, we hope that all this is done with a lens of sustainability to um, retaining water on your property, conserving water and energy, supporting wildlife and sequestering carbon, all those points that, that Ellie just took us to. It's important to understand that there is not scientific research that supports all of our recommendation. Um, I will point out through the presentation where recommendations are specifically supported by scientific research. Um, and also as we go through today's pres tonight's presentation, any items you see highlighted in red represent um, county code requirements for us here in Sonoma County. Okay, let's start with some basic concepts for creating a firewise landscape. 
So we recommend choosing fire resistant landscape features such as inorganic mulch, um, gravel or decomposed granite as examples, permeable pavement, stone walls, ponds, dry creek beds or boulders. Then carefully selecting and placing plants with um, spacing to disrupt fire coming through your landscape. And then, as I mentioned before, ongoing maintenance is critical to keep your landscape healthy and prepared for the next fire. So throughout the, throughout the year, you need to remove any dead or dying shrubs, trees, or branches. You want to avoid planting close to structures as embers landing in those plants can transmit fire to your home. And you want to prune all tree limbs up six feet from the ground or one third of the height of a smaller tree. For example, if a tree is 12 feet high, you want to limit up to four feet from the ground. And then, of course, continue to maintain that as it grows larger. And again, um, these items highlighted in red um, are um, Sonoma County code requirements. Okay, so you want to make it easy for firefighters to find you, right? To be able to find your home if it's in the middle of the night, as often our fire starts have been. So if you have multiple driveways off of one access road, for example, you would want to place an address sign, a fluorescent address sign at the beginning with, of the road with all of the numbers, and then place the sign at each driveway and on the house. And reflective street and address um, signs are a county code requirement. So there's a really compelling video from the Kincaid fire where firefighters are trying to hold off the fire from moving into the town of Windsor. And the video clip shows wood fences burning um, and moving fire directly to homes. So it's very important to replace any wooden fence or gate that attaches to your home. And there are some, these just show some different examples of um, alternatives to consider that still could provide you screening or protection while, um, while also if you're interested helping to preserve your views. Okay, let's dive into plant selection considerations. So a poorly planted plant is stressed and requires more water, nutrients, and is more susceptible to predation, drought, and fire. So choosing the right plant and putting it in the right place is an incredibly important concept in firewise landscaping. So um, many of you um, may have come to this session hoping for a fire resistant plant list. Um, and I just want to point out that um, there is a, um, no um, consistency from a scientific perspective on um, uh, or consensus on what the elements are that make one plant more flammable than a, a, the next. So for the University of California, our position is not to advocate or support fire resistant plant lists because of that lack of scientific consensus on that issue. And in addition, um, I feel that it really creates a false sense of security and that more importantly, you need to consider placement, design, and maintenance um, as we'll go through uh, later in the presentation. But it's also important to, um, to really um, think about our plants with a different lens. And um, I'm as, as guilty of this as I'm sure many of us. Um, it's so tempting when you go into a nursery and see a really beautiful flowering plant and you love the bloom and you love the color and you want to add that to your garden. But from a fire wise and a sustainability perspective, there's much um, broader considerations that we need to be taking into account. So it's really important to choose plants that will go grow to a size that's appropriate for the location where you're putting them. So when you pick up that four inch pot with a plant at the nursery, you need to really pay attention to what its mature size will be and where you're planning to put it in your landscape. So you, of course you wanna locate plants where excess pruning is not required to maintain your desired spacing. Are you putting the plant somewhere where it will thrive? If a plant that prefers, or if it's a plant that prefers shade, are you putting it in full sun? Or are you up for the maintenance that that plant will require? Is it invasive? Or will it spread to a neighbor's property and possibly create a fire threat? You also want to think about how a plant might change over its lifespan. Uh, lavender is a great example where it starts out as herbaceous, but it come, becomes much more woody over time. And I have to say, after being deeply enmeshed in this topic, frankly, since the 2017 fires, I've started to see my own landscape through a different lens. So I think about how fire will move through the landscape around my home and how much fuel that would add to the fire. And in particular, I'm looking at 
um, woody mass in plant materials and, um, and how those are spaced um, and, uh, and how I have those placed uh, in that zero to 100 foot zone. Um, so uh, there's lots of opportunities. There's um, uh, many plants that I have, like for example, a salvia in my garden that had gotten very woody. Um, I did a pretty hard cut back on it to cut back that woody mass and it came back with much more herbaceous, um, less woody growth. Now I know I'm gonna have to maintain that salvia on a regular basis as it will develop that woodier construct over time, but I'm willing to um, accept that maintenance and know that I will do that maintenance um, to maintain it to be um, more fire wise. So I just talked about this, all plants will burn, even fire safe plants that you see on many plant lists. And uh, as I stressed, uh, it's important to keep all of our landscape plants healthy with appropriate watering, proper pruning and upkeep to reduce the risk. Um, and cannot say often enough that proper maintenance is really key to fire resistant and it's particularly important to keep dead leaves and branches from accumulating in the center of a plant, which will um, make it more flammable. Okay, where shouldn't we plant? So uh, I'm gonna um, spend more time shortly on the zero to five foot zone um, around your house. Scientific research does support making this an ember free zone to prevent embers from igniting your home when they land in organic matter uh, directly adjacent to your home. But other places that are especially vulnerable to fire include under vents and eaves, in front of windows or combustible siding, under or near decks and inside corners of your home. So these are all places where embers could um, directly introduce fire into your home. Okay, hopefully you're all familiar with the concept of ladder fuels. Um, the goal is to reduce the possibility of having fire move from the ground plane uh, into the crowns of the trees. So we wanna avoid planting shrubs under trees. Uh, but if you do, um, you have to make sure that you're allowing at least three times the height of a shrub between it and the lowest limb of the tree. Um, and again, uh, we want to limb up all trees at least six feet from the ground or uh, one third the height of the tree. Uh, and then, of course, it's critical to continue to maintain it uh, as it grows, as it matures. Okay, um, these are graphics um, very kindly developed by um, our partner Ellie, Lins Ellie Inslee. Thank you, Ellie, for these graphics. A lot of the graphics that you see around ideal spacing guidelines for plant materials come from, um, uh, I think, the world where fire was mostly uh, forest-based, um, so it shows a lot of conifers, and we felt like uh, it didn't really kind of accurately depict what a landscape might look like for us here in Sonoma County. So really grateful to Ellie for creating these graphics for us. So I want to stress that these are um, CAL FIRE recommendations. These are not a county code requirement. Um, but these are recommendations based on CAL FIRE's best experience uh, in firefighting for plant spacing guidelines within 100 feet of your home. Um, so can't stress enough, these are not, um, this, these spacing guidelines are not mandated by law. Um, so these guidelines for horizontal, both horizontal and vertical spacing are due to flame height and the slope of the land around the home, which is a major consideration in assessing wildfire risk. A fire will burn faster and more intensely uphill than on a long flat ground, and a steeper slope will result in a faster moving fire with longer flame lengths. So um, spacing between grasses, shrubs, and trees is crucial to reduce the spread of wildfires. Uh, and the spacing need is, of course, greater. Um, it's a wider distance based on the slope of the land. So on flat to gently sloping terrain, individual shrubs or small clumps of shrubs should be separated from one another by at least twice the height of the average shrub. And for homes on, um, located on steeper slopes or landscapes within the 100 foot zone on steeper slopes, that separation distance would be greater. For example, if the typical shrub height in a plant grouping is two feet, then we wanna create a separation between those shrub plantings of at least four feet by either removing some existing shrubs or pruning to reduce their height and or diameter if you're working with a mature or existing landscape. 
So um, this graphic is depicting shrub spacing, um, low growing or well irrigated grasses, ground covers or perennials, much lower plane are considered to be acceptable between these plant groupings in our discussions with the um, Sonoma County Office of Fire and Emergency Services. But frankly, each of us needs to assess the overall risk of, at our own home property with the degree of slope um, and um, the fire, you know, fire risk reduction considerations we wanna make um, for making appropriate decisions in our own home landscapes. This graphic is depicting um, suggested horizontal spacing um, as well as vertical separation um, for trees. Uh, and note again, the three times the height of the shrub from the top of the shrub to the lowest tree branch. Um, and spacing on less than a 20% slope, for example, a spacing of 10 feet between the trees is recommended. And again, on steeper slopes, of course, that recommended distance is increased. So um, we don't have to denude our landscapes in the 100 foot perimeter around our home, but we do want to make sure we have spacing to reduce the fuel volume and to help break up the flow of fire to your home. So the previous slides showed CAL FIRE recommendations on tree and shrub spacing. This is actually a recommendation from the NFPA or the National Fire Protection Association. And there's good arguments in our talking to, to fire personnel, there are good arguments to justify both perspectives. This just provides you another view on possible tree spacing based on the distance from your home. Um, these are all best recommendations to support improving your um, home's fire safety. And again, you wanna consider your own property's um, specific aspect. Okay, so let's move into a discussion of the defensible space zones around your house starting at the next step after you've hardened your home, which is the zero to five foot zone. So zone zero is the zero to five foot zone and it's called the ember defense zone. And the objective is this zone is to reduce the chance of windblown embers, right? So um, that's what we're understanding is one of the highest, um, the highest uh, factors in a home uh, catching on fire. We want to reduce the chance of those windblown embers from a fire landing near the home and igniting combustible debris or materials, thus exposing the home to flames. So this zone is closest to the house, so it requires the most careful selection and management of vegetation and other possible fuels. So the recommendation, and this is based on scientific research, um, this is a relatively newer zone introduced into the defensible space recommendations when we started last year to pull our presentation together, we couldn't find any graphics that, that represented the zero to five foot zone. That's how new that is um, into our lexicon. But this is supported by research that was conducted by Dr. Stephen Quarles after he left the University of California and moved to doing research with the Insurance Institute of Business, Home and Safety. And there's some amazing videos online showing them doing testing in the lab um, of uh, showing the risk to the home uh, resulting from embers in this zone. So I wanna stress that this is a scientifically supported recommendation, but you know, perhaps it's the one that people will struggle with the most because it's really counter to what we have historically done in our home landscapes, which is to, um, to establish uh, foundation shrubs directly against and around the perimeter of a home. So um, it, it's a real, um, uh, paradigm shift for us and how we think about our landscapes. Um, but April has some great pictures and graphics to show you um, how beautifully it can be done um, to achieve the, uh, the important goal of minimizing fuel um, that could transmit in immediate pr proximity that would transmit fire to your home. So during a wildfire, thousands of embers can rain down on roofs and pelt the side of homes like hail during a storm. Uh, and if these embers become lodged in something e easily ignited um, on or near a house, the home will be in jeopardy of burning. So we're not saying that, um, and this is another really important point we wanna stress. We're not saying, and there is no code requirement that requires that existing trees must be removed around your home. Um, but you absolutely need to consider um, regular maintenance of those trees um, and what um, what litter they might deposit in your gutters and on your roof. Um, so uh, if, if you have a tree that's close to your home, you absolutely need to make sure you're regular, uh, regularly cleaning the roof and the gutter of debris during fire season. 
Um, county code does require cutting limbs within 10 feet of a stove pipe or chimney outlet. Um, but, um, you know, we end up in a lot of conversations with folks thinking they have to remove all the trees, mature trees around their home. And it's really more about um, uh, considering um, the maintenance aspects of that tree in proximity to your home. And then, of course, the code requirement if it is within 10 feet of a um, stovepipe or chimney outlet. Okay, so here are the maintenance recommendations for zone zero, and these should be done on a regular basis during fire season. Um, I certainly know that during our last um, um, uh, red flag warning that we had just last weekend, I was out in my garden doing all of these things um, on Sunday morning. So um, these are all um, county code requirements um, to uh, regularly clean up and dispose of leaves, pine needles, or other plant litter in this zero to five foot zone removing the debris from roof and gutters, and then that climbing vines must be free of dead or dying material is actually a zero to 30 foot requirement, but zero to five obviously applies in there. That's the specific county code is for zero to 30. And that's why we included it on the slide for uh, the zero to five foot zone uh, maintenance requirement. Okay, now let's move to zone one which is the five to 30 foot zone, also called the home defense zone and kind of classically referred to as uh, lean, clean and green. Um, and in the home defense zone, you really wanna be thinking about access for firefighters who may be there making a stand to defend your home in this zone. Okay, so in zone one, the recommendation is to um, plant in islands separated by hardscape. Um, optimally, you want to um, select plant materials such as low ground covers, mown native grass, herbaceous perennials, or succulents, right? You want to keep potential fuel low to the ground. Um, but this is really a great zone for hardscape elements such as a pool, a brick patio, paving stones, a dry creek bed, or boulders. So the goal is to reduce the connectivity between your garden beds shrubs and trees. So if wildfire does come into this zone, it will not be able to burn to the house or into the crowns of the trees. Um, so we want to, um, you can include uh, shrubs or trees in this zone, but I would suggest that you might want to uh, consider a specimen or individual shrub or tree that you can really show off in future and keep your, um, keep your plant material on the ground plane as much as possible. Uh, and if you are inclu including trees and shrubs in the zone and it's, it's more than um, maybe a specimen or an individual, then you absolutely want to be keeping the CAL FIRE spacing guidelines uh, that we discussed earlier in this zone. And of course, um, absolutely always rem remembering to avoid ladder fuels um, and making sure you're absolutely optimizing the health uh, of the plants in this zone. And it is a code requirement, county code requirement to move wood piles over 30 feet from, uh, from buildings. Okay, so now let's move to zone two, the reduced fuel zone. Uh, and the objective of the reduced fuel zone is to create and maintain a landscape that, again, if ignited, is not going to readily transmit fire to your home. So in this one, we really have the same basic principles as zone one, uh, but you can include larger trees and shrubs in widely spaced groups. Um, so you still want to continue the focus on creating islands of, um, of vegetation that are separated by hardscape, right, breaking up that flow of fire. Uh, and to keep in mind that you want to ensure you have easy access for maintenance, and of course, again, that you're being vigilant about removing ladder fuels. Wide pathways can help separate planting areas and help simplify that maintenance, and it is a county code requirement to keep annual grasses mown to a maximum height of four inches. So uh, we have some um, a number of invasive plants that are problematic for us, especially in the Wooey here in Sonoma County. Uh, Scotch and French brooms in particular are major problems as are pampas grass and Mexican feather grass. So you wanna make sure you're removing any invasive plants which can spread to neighboring properties. And it's really important once you've done the work to harden your home and you've prepared your defensible space in the zero to 100 foot zone, it's important to reach out and work with your neighbors. Um, your, in fact, your zero to 100 foot defensible space zone may in fact extend uh, into a neighbor's property. So 
some of the considerations um, for uh, working together as a neighborhood are perhaps developing a neighborhood fuel reduction plan, um, watching for maintenance needed, uh, such as debris accumulating on a neighbor's roof or uncovered wood piles or unmown tall weeds, um, and really considering the total volume of vegetation in the area and whether there are any ladder fuels. Some other neighborhood considerations, um, look at the space in between the homes to look at how you can minimize the risk, but also look for opportunities to support biodiversity by creating uh, habitat corridors. And April's gonna share a lot of great suggestions for you on some wonderful native habitat plants that you might consider. And there's also many wonderful COPE groups that have um, really taken off uh, here in Sonoma County. And those COPE groups are working as a team in their neighborhoods on fire preparedness. But I also want to stress that our local firefighters are an excellent resource for guidance as well and really great, uh, grateful to have Jeff and Cindy on, um, on the workshop with us today. Okay, you want to ensure that you, your family, and firefighters all have clear access in and out of your property. Um, you want to maintain vegetation on both sides of, road, of, of any roads and driveway. And vegetation management should be 10 feet um, horizontally from the road edge and 15 feet vertically. Uh, and you want to make sure you've got a 12 foot unobstructive pavement for the passage of vehicles. So what would we do to make this driveway more firewise? We would follow those same management principles that we just talked about in zone two. Um, mowing the native annual grasses or the not, probably non-native annual grasses um, to four inches. Uh, and then limbing up these trees so you've got better clearance and uh, you're reducing the possible um, uh, risk of ladder fuels. Okay, and if you reside in a more densely forested area, you can control fire behavior by reducing ladder fuels, opening up the tree canopy, and maintaining your ground fuels. So those are pretty consistent themes that we've been talking about. And this will help firefighters with fire suppression uh, during a fire. And of course, because new vegetation will regenerate in these areas, uh, you're gonna need to make sure you're re-entering the stand uh, every few years for ongoing maintenance. Okay, mulch. So um, uh, a layer of mulch really helps with weed suppression and it's uh, incredibly important for um, uh, water conservation in a sustainable landscape. But wood mulches are organic and so they are fuel um, and as such can transmit fire. Um, so it's recommended to um, not use mulch in a wide or continuous manner across your uh, defensible space zone. Again, we want to separate um, your islands of planting with that you would have mulched um, for water conservation and weed suppression. You want to separate those islands, hopefully with non-combustible or ignition resistant materials such as concrete, gravel, rock, or even a native grass lawn. Um, com composted wood chips uh, have demonstrated the least hazardous fire behavior overall. Uh, there was a study done by the University of Nevada at Reno and the University of California, and they tested eight different mulch treatments. Um, so you want to choose a lar larger size arbor mulch, um, uh, optimally composted, right, not freshly chipped, um, and absolutely no gorilla hair. The smoldering combust combustion produced by that mulch treatment um, may not be readily noticeable during a wildfire event and may go undetected by firefighters and may start after firefighters have left the area. And Amy? It, yeah. Could I jump in? Because this is such a great slide. Yeah. Um, the, there's two things that are going on in this slide right here. We have juniper, and juniper <laughs> is one of those plants that, um, you know, most plants that have an oil or an odor to them burn very hot. And juniper in particular, uh, we noticed this on the glass fire up in the Los Alamos area. Um, we lost some homes and I think it was directly related to juniper. So you've got juniper right there close yep. to the home with, with combustible mulch right around it. This is like the double whammy right here. So yep. this home wouldn't stand a chance unless firefighters were on scene, to be honest with you. And yeah. a wooden, uh, wooden fence that's up against. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, you guys. Thanks for pointing out all the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all the no-nos in the picture. <laughs> um, and I want to stress that um, uh, in particular, I, I think there's a lot of instances where juniper is either used in large masses and is never maintained and possibly not irrigated. So that just creates a more stressed plant with lots of dead 
um, debris and um, branches within the interior of the of the planting. Um, That's a great point. That's a great point because people look at this and go, well, it's green. So yeah. that should be good. We right. always try to pull it apart and say, look down inside. That's, yeah, and, the, that's the bad stuff. Yeah, and often you'll see the juniper planted directly next to, you know, adjacent to a deck. Yeah. And in fact, you know, one of our supervisors on our board of supervisors is firmly convinced that she lost her home because of unmaintained juniper that she had in direct proximity to her deck and that, that transmitted the fire to her home. She's on a mission to obliterate juniper in yes. Sonoma County. <laughs> I will say there's some really lovely, you know, again, it's be, so I, we try to stay away from the vilification of plants. It's really about, is it healthy and well-maintained? Is it in an island separated by hardscape? Is it, you know, not up in direct proximity to the home? Um, there's a really lovely ground cover juniper that's a native. Um, uh, so I think it's, it's all in the context of that plant selection that we talked about earlier. Are you willing to maintain it? Um, are you putting it in the right place? Um, uh, yeah, all, all uh, major considerations as we look at our home landscapes. But th thank you so much for pointing those, those weaknesses out, Chief Foreman, I really appreciate that. Um, so I, th I think we've stressed this point pretty well. Um, much of your success is going to depend on ongoing maintenance in your defensible space zone. Uh, of course, code requirement to remove dead plants and dead branches from trees and shrubs. Uh, and you want to remove vines climbing up into trees and shrubs. Um, and then really throughout the year, uh, you want to continuously monitor for needed maintenance. Um, here are maintenance recommendations annually before fire season. Um, Ellie did a really great job explaining why it's important to do pruning and vegetation thinning in fall and early winter uh, to avoid harm for um, during bird breeding season, which generally runs from mid-February to the end of July. Um, we talked about the importance and that it's a code requirement to mow annual grasses and weeds to four inches tall or less, but don't cut grass to bare dirt. It's really important to keep a viable vegetation in place for erosion control, uh, you know, uh, especially if you're on a slope. Um, we want to be particularly sensitive about dry leaf litter at the beginning of and throughout fire season. Like I said, I was out removing all the leaves in the fire foot, five foot perimeter around my house um, uh, last weekend. And that's an important practice we all need to start getting into on red flag warning days to really take a critical look, walk around the exterior of our home and, and make sure any cushions have been brought in, any you know, um, quar door mats outside our door, that the leaves are all removed, that our gutters are clean. Um, really important things we need to do to help um, uh, improve the defensibility um, and um, saving of our homes during a wildfire. And maybe a, a good concept in what you were just talking about, mm -hmm. and this is just a great time to, in, in, you know, put this thought in there, is, you know, we need to walk around our properties and look at what is a receptive fuel bed. That's yep. just a concept I really want people to grab onto today. What is a receptive fuel bed around my property? And you talked about some of those. It's mm -hmm. not just the vegetation. It is those cushions on that wicker chair that's right up against the building or under the window. It's the doormat. It's, it's our stuff, right? Our stuff is a receptive fuel bed. So when we're looking at trying to get ready, when we know we're going into these events where the likelihood of a fire is high um, and we want to kind of, you know, prep and defend, right? Um, that is what you're looking at when you're walking around the outside of your property is what are those receptive fuel beds, yep. both vegetation and man-made. And I, I, you phrased that really beautifully, um, Chief. And I, um, I feel like I have a different lens as I walk around my property. And it, it isn't just about the landscape, but it, it, is, it certainly is looking at that and what I need to be doing from a maintenance perspective. But it is also those broader factors. Thanks so much for reinforcing that. Okay, so from a maintenance perspective, every few years as needed, we want to continue to look at thinning and reducing tree canopies to remove twiggy growth and maintain separation between the trees and reduce the overall fuel load. Um, again, keeping our lowest branches of trees pruned up at least six feet from the ground, cutting back ground covers and vines to remove buildup of dried stems and dead leaves. I was doing that last weekend with some, some dried out uh, vinca on a hillside that was planted probably 30 years ago and is impossible to get rid of completely. 
but you know had died back because it wasn't irrigated and I was cutting that back uh, during red flag just to make sure that we were reducing fire risk. And then um, you might want to consider cutting back shrubs to, to renew them. Okay, so most of us are not starting from a blank slate and we have a mature existing landscape and you know it's really easy to share all these um, you know, design recommendations with you in the defensible space zone that would be easy to implement in a, you know, uh, if you have a blank, starting from a blank slate. Um, so I um, wanted to share this graphic, which comes from um, an East Bay Mud, great um, publication on firescaping. This graphic is showing you before maintenance, where we've got examples of ladder fuels and no break of, in the planted areas and shrubs masked up against the house. Uh, and here's our after maintenance, where we now see islands of vegetation, the shrubs next to the house have been removed, trees are limbed up and have been kept at least 10 feet away from the chimney outlet, um, ladder fields are removed and shrubs and trees have been thinned. So um, it's, it's a hard thing to do to look at an existing landscape and think about what you need to do uh, in terms of um, uh, better fire readiness. Um, but hope this graphic helps a little bit in depicting kind of some of the considerations you might want to start thinking about. So this is another great East Bay Mud graphic um, that's a, a really wonderful illustration of recommended tree maintenance. I want to stress again, I, I tried to stress this at the start of the presentation, county code requirements do not require removal of overhanging branches over a roof or in proximity to a home, except for within that 10 feet of a chimney or a stove pipe. Um, but again, it's very important to clean leaf litter from your roof and gutters during fire season. Um, and reinforcing, once again, it is a county code requirement to remove dead or dying branches. But you can see in the graphic, um, uh, the um, kind of yellowish green is showing um, opportunities for thinning the tree canopy. Of course, you wanna mow those grasses uh, or um, weeds uh, to four inches and of course uh, remove um, possible um, low hanging branches up to six or 10 feet from the surfaces. It was yeah, East Bay Mud's recommendation um, to reduce the possibility of fire transmitting um, from the ground plate up into the trees. Okay, I just threw a ton of information at you really fast um, in about 40 minutes. So I thought I would, I added this is a new slide where I thought I'd try to recap some of the key recommendations we made. Um, so you just saw, you know, 45 plus slides, but, but here are some of the key things that, that we're trying to stress. So start at your house and work out, right? But in the zero to 100 foot zone, defensible space zone, in the zero to five foot zone, that zone zero, you wanna use inorganic materials such as gravel or stepping stones and of course remove any uh, and replace any flammable fencing materials that are attached to the house. In that five to 30 foot zone from the house, you wanna plant in islands separated by hardscape. Um, again, it's a really great zone for hardscape elements such as patios, um, dry creek beds or um, pools. Um, and we wanna plant uh, materials such as low herbaceous perennials, right? They're less woody um, so um, create less um, intense um, fuel for uh, developing the heat of the fire. You want to choose herbaceous perennials, grasses, or succulents is really optimal. And again, specimen or individual shree, shrub or tree or shree, I, maybe I could just shorten that to shree, shrub or tree um, <laughs> placement is optimal. And then in that 30 to 100 foot zone, same basic principles as 5 to 30, but you can include shrub and tree groupings in widely spaced groups separated by areas that help break up the spread of wildfire. Um, and I, so I hope we've given you a basic framework for evaluating your landscape in the defensible space zone. April's gonna take you into some, um, April has the really fun part of the presentation with beautiful pictures of beautiful plants and gardens to help kind of translate um, what uh, the content that I've just shared with you based on the different zones and of course native plant selection uh, to support biodiversity. Um, but our key, key takeaways are really to choose fire resistant uh, landscape materials, arrange landscape plants with spacing to disrupt fire, maintain those, keep them um, well irrigated, healthy and well pruned, um, remove any um, dead materials, um, avoid 
um, planting uh, close to structures, especially near vents, under windows, or exposed eaves. And then I think I've hit on the prune your tree limbs up at least six feet um, uh, enough times. But we really truly believe that our home landscapes can be firewise and sustainable. Um, again, plant placement and designer key maintenance is essential. Start at the house and work out um, and, and please um, implement the Ember Defense Zone as you can. It's, it is supported by science and is uh, an incredibly important aspect to save your home uh, in our next wildland fire. So with that, I will turn it over to our partner, um, April Owens from Habitat Cork Project. Oh, we were going to maybe take a few questions mm -hmm. to full transition. Yeah. Giving you a fire nice of information. Or anything that the fire officials want to talk about for a few minutes here, just to take a little. That was yeah. a lot of wonderful information, Amy and Ellie. Yeah, one, one thing I wanted to, to mention is um, I, as we've been having these fires, and I just want to talk about a little bit of anecdotal evidence that, that I have seen. And, and one of the things that we have seen is how much the home hardening process almost trumps the defensible space. What I've seen in the glass fire, the Kincaid fire, the, the uh, Tubbs fire firsthand is that homes that are right next to the fire's edge are surviving and homes that are blocks away are burning down because of improper vents, not maintaining your roof, a lot of the things that you guys have talked about, specifically that zero to five foot non-combustible zone and uh, not having the right size vents and all of this, the lack of maintenance around the home. And so what we're seeing is that when people come in and they put some time and energy and it's not an expensive process that you can really grab that low hanging fruit and it's the small things that make a really big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we never want to take away the fact that that defensible space is, is you know, a, a massive component of home survivability. Um, however, you know, as Jeff mentioned, there are very affordable ways to retrofit your home. Um, you know, one of the big losses in the Tubbs fire in particular was um, ember intrusion into attics and crawl spaces. Uh, and that was through that, that venting that's required. Homes have to have that breathability, right? There has to be that air movement. Um, but we can, we can minimize those, those uh, vents mesh, the mesh that's put on those vents um, to any, you know, typically they're a quarter inch, taking them down to a one eighth or a one sixteenth still gives us that airflow, but it does help with, with disallowing ember intrusion. And that makes a big difference. You know, all of us literally drove by homes that were there and we came back two or three hours or 24 hours later and they were gone. That was from ember intrusion. That was embers getting into crawl spaces or attics and that fire going undiscovered for a period of time. It got well seated and then we lost the home. That was a direct thing from ember intrusion into those concealed spaces. So you can actually spend a lot, you know, a, a larger amount of money, go out and buy uh, what they call 7A building standard compliant uh, vents. Um, if you build a home now in the wildland urban interface, you have to comply with a building and fire code standard that basically dictates your construction products, the products that you build your home with. They have to be ignition resistant products. And one of the components of that is the venting. And so you have to put in a compliant 7A vent, which is, uh, you know, for an example, one product, I'm not, I'm not condoning this product in particular, but one is called a Vulcan vent. And it is basically a vent that disallows ember intrusion. You can retrofit your home right now with that. And, and the cost is fairly minimal, but if you build your home now, that's a requirement when you build that home. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, the other concept that, and, and I really appreciate that y'all touched on this. You touched on firefighter safety because what every, but the public has to remember is that we go through these neighborhoods prior to that fire front coming through. And frankly, we go through looking at what home can we actually safely defend? What, what mm -hmm. can we, can we put ourselves in this driveway? And even if the fire bumps up against us, is it survivable for us? Do we have a fighting chance? And you want your property to be, property to be one of those that we actually think we have a fighting chance at. 
because yeah. I have to be honest with you, it's very hard to say this in a public forum. There are lots of homes that we have to frankly drive by because number one, they're not savable, and number two, they're a death trap for us. Hmm. So and really powerful um, pictures after the Kincaid fire in Windsor where you could see that the firefighters threw firewood that was directly like next to the front door, like into the lawn. And I mean, the last thing you wanna be doing is making a firefighter have to take any of their time to do something that you should have done before you evacuated from your house or you should have done on a flag morning weekend. So it just incredibly important for us to do when a red flag is in effect that we're doing that perimeter check that we're making sure you know, everything's staged and ready and that, you know, that the firefighters can be spending their time where they need to when they're in those incredibly intense moments. Do we want to shift to April's? There was a question around arbors and decks, but maybe we can, um, maybe we can hold that to the end. April, do you want to move into your presentation? Liz and Annie, do you, is, are there any questions coming up that you want to address? I, I mean, at five more minutes of questions is fine. Okay. So Jeff and Cindy, there was a question about um, how do experts feel about arbors and decks connected to the home and our roof. Do you have thoughts or perspective on that? I, well, I think we both have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> I'll, I'll just take a, a quick second. It, it comes back down to the, all the construction features that we have on our home. There is beautiful material that you can have. For instance, I have a deck that's attached to my house. It's made out of bat two hardwood decking. It's ironwood. It's very similar to Ipe. It's affordable and has a class A fire rating. So anything that we have attached to the house and in that zone, it's a, we're, we're strong proponents that it needs to be, have that class A fire rating. And you can look into how they get that rating. It's, it has to be able to withstand the fire for an hour and they do it with a, a wood block and they burn it. But one thing that I, you've said about during red flag warnings and having that dictate some of our behavior, we fight these fires 10 years before they come. And that is just so key. And I know this is a harsh statement, but this is what I say to my crews when we're out there and we're triaging these homes. And it's, if you don't care, I can't care. So the time when this fire front's coming in, and we're seeing the embers like you're talking about, which is the number one reason why we're losing these homes. That's not the time for us to be uh, removing the propane tanks from the, from the house, removing the firewood from the house, getting up on the roofs and blowing out the uh, leaves because they don't have gutter guards. It, we, we don't have the resources to do that. Usually in the first 24, 48 hours, we're waiting for the resources to come in, sometimes all through the nation, even the country during the Tubbs fire. Um, coming from Australia and everything else. It takes us some time to get these resources. So the more that people do before the red flag warning and hardening their homes, but to get back to your question, anytime that something is attached to the house, it needs to be uh, class A non-combustible is what I'm a proponent. Cindy can tell you, she came and helped me evacuate while she was in getting my animals out of my house during the glass fire. I had a chainsaw and I was cutting my fence off of my house. And it's like, I teach people on how to evacuate and everything else. And here I am doing something <laughs> that I should have did a long time ago. I was guilty. Yeah. I'm actually glad you said it because I was going to bring that up. And then I thought, gosh, I don't know that I want to call him out on this. So uh, Jeff's absolutely right. He was out there with a chainsaw, literally chainsawing his beautiful fence off the side of his house because he knew yeah. this was, you know, we'd look at it as a conduit, right? It's a conduit. And, and I'll be honest, you know, look at Coffee Park. You know, a lot of folks that you talk to about Coffee Park was home to home ignition. There was a conduit for that. And a lot of that was wood fences. And there were actually civilians going in and recognizing this and actually knocking down fences to stop that fire flow and that conduit from home to home ignition. So, you know, Jeff's points are, are extremely valid and look, I say this every time I get an opportunity to speak to a group, take your power back. Look, there are things we can do, right? I, I mean, fire is fire and it's gonna do what it's gonna do, but there are things we can do to take our power back and make our homes and our environment survivable. Um, you know, I think the myth that people have is that these neighborhoods are being destroyed by this wall of flames that comes through and it is not the case. That is not what is burning down our neighborhoods and, and driving through, through our communities. It is the ember cast. And, you know, I've said this for, I've been in the fire service for 25 years. I've said this for years. Ember cast can go a mile to two miles ahead of the fire front. Well, guess what? 
Tubbs fire took that all took that one to two mile and threw it out the window. It was five, six, Sebastopol, right? There was fire debris in Sebastopol from the Tubbs fire. So, you know, that is the enemy here. We can be thinking we're making a difference in one place. And all of a sudden we look ahead and there's fire 500,000 feet ahead of us because of ember cast. So again, receptive fuel beds, get that concept in your head. What is a receptive fuel bed on my property? And yeah. particularly adjacent to my home, that five foot exclusion zone, right? And receptive fuel bed, that's the, that's the best term I can plant in everybody's head. And, and the other one that I really wanna plant in everybody's head is break up the continuity. Um, Mimi, everybody's done giving you some great visuals Break up the continuity of your fuels. Get rid of the juveniles. Get, give those mature plants and trees a chance to grow and get mature and get fire hardy. Oak and redwood and some of those, they're very hardy to fire if they're mature, right? And so get rid of the juveniles. Break up the continuity. Remove the receptive fuel beds. Take your power back. Love it. I, I receptive feel, but I just made a note of that. I've got to add that to my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. I'm just sharing my screen so we can get kind of into the next step. Which is cool. so April, I think you're going to have to get a little closer. We're having a hard time hearing you. Okay, I'll up my. Perfect. Yeah, back. So can you guys see my whole screen? Yeah, we can see your whole screen currently. I think I accidentally muted you, April. Sorry. Unmute. Okay. You can hear me? April, it's not in presentation format, though. It, okay, let's do that. Let's try view present. Better? Perfect. Yay. I always have to be super close. To, I don't know why my speakers are funny about this. So yell at me if you can't hear me. Um, so is it a good time for me to move on? Okay. Wow. The content has been adapting so much in our group and our coalition that this is just blowing my mind. Like the amount of work and um, and adaption that Ellie and Mimi have brought into this workshop. I, I, and it's so wonderful to have um, Cindy and the fire officials here to help because I'm gonna call on you um, when I talk about uh, trees over homes again, because we will revisit this and it's something that we continue to, to try to address um, with, especially in the, in the WUI. So I am April Owens. And I am the executive director of the Habitat Corridor Project. And our mission is to create and promote California native plant restoration gardens in the urban environment. But we have been called on to address the WUI as well. So we had typically been in more urban spaces, but now we've been moving into this wild and urban interface and trying to address um, how to help people create these resilient landscapes um, in in their in in this this crazy interface that happens really closely, especially in Santa Rosa. Like it's really quick that you know you're down and and um, and wiki up, and then all of a sudden you're at Mark West, and you've been helping a lot of folks in that space. So we create um, leading by example. We design and install create, uh, California native gardens, and um, replacing lawns and tra traditional. Um, water intensive landscapes, which was really where we started. Um, and then restoring landscape in the wildlife, hab wildlife habitat and trying to show people how their urban landscapes can be these little islands. And I know we talk about a lot about islands in the landscape and we'll talk about that more in this workshop, but we really feel like every landscape in the urban environment can be a little island for biodiversity. So you can create, you can take out your lawn and create your little island so that the, the butterflies and birds and bees can, can migrate their way through the urban environment. And then we also have a website that where we educate and we try to have downloadable plans, 
um, lawn replacement plans, irrigation plans, and then these wonderful, this is really our most recent um, iteration is being a part of these workshops and helping you all um, visualize the content that Mimi was talking about and incorporate the um, LA's, um, what the Sonoma Ecology Center is talking about, about the ecology of landscape. And I'm gonna keep my workshop, I need to watch my time, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up about 7.40 so that we have plenty of time for questions because I know that there's gonna be a lot of discussion and questions happening in here. And I have cats and dogs and just ignore them all. Um, the resilient landscapes, Ellie, Ellie and I met up um, 18 months ago or so um, when she was starting to think about how we were gonna address um, um, this whole idea of being fire wise and biodiverse. So really resilient. So we started thinking about the systems thinking of resilient landscapes in California aren't, aren't just, you know, there's not one piece in California that we're dealing with. We're dealing with drought, fire, development, and, and the loss of biodiversity. So, and I love this little definition of resilient, which is capable of withstanding shock without permanent just deformation or rupture. So that's really, you know, we are looking at fire and we're looking at coming back from fire and we're looking at saving water. And we are we are resilient in California already, no matter what, after all these years of fire. Um, so I'm gonna have little tips on here and you guys can just read them. Um, Vines. That's where I started as a landscape architect and designer, um, spending a lot of time out hiking where I live. So for those of you living in the Wui and, and you know, you're in these all, there's all these different plant communities that you're addressing in your landscape. But, you know, as much as you can take a hike, even after fires, you know, get out there on Sonoma Mountain and, and um, experience what, how like a slower fire versus like the 2017 fires. There's and I know, you know, Cindy and Jeff, you guys will talk about like how different these fires were like, heat wise um, and, and how we're gonna come back in the, in the native environment. So sustainability, I'm a designer. So I believe in the Iroquois definition of sustainability, which is like providing for future generations with what we're using, what we're doing right now. So I have a 14 year old son and I wanna make sure that he has the, he has the opportunities that I have now in our landscapes. Um, and also sustainability comes with design. So really thinking about your landscape as we address like all the, like all the content that Mimi went into, really like backing up and looking at your, your landscape. And I oftentimes will come on and talk to, to people on their sites, even a lot of the fire rebuilds that we're working on now. And they know their landscape so much better than I would just walking on a landscape. They're like, well, this little corner in the winter gets wind and, and this is where the sun is. And so just sitting down and really uh, uh, like thinking about like the seasonality in your landscape and just doing a little sketch. You don't have to be a professional, but just thinking about like, well, where does the water flow and where would we sink water in? And and um, just listening is a lot of my job as, as a designer, because people like, they're like, oh, this little corner, like even Ellie working on her landscape, but this little corner is warm and, and you know, this is a great place in the morning and this is a great place in the evening. So knowing, knowing your landscape and really watching and not rushing into it is something that I, I really recommend for all of us as we design our landscapes. So I'm just gonna go through and not really, um, go over again what El, what El Nini really talked about, but just like look at some images and kind of give some, a little bit of my thoughts and um, and about, and show you some images, um, just some, some ideas in these spaces because zero to five doesn't have to be nothing. I mean, it doesn't have to be the old 1930s lava rock front yard, which I think a lot of people <laughs> have been doing. Um, there, there's an opportunity here for decorative, decorative rock and boulders, um, permeable hardscape. There's all kinds of beautiful um, rocks and stones and gravels that you can use. Um, like Ellie was talking about fountains for bees and birds and butterflies. Like our, when we take out our lawns and take out water in our landscape, 
we really need to add that back in for, for our fellow um, pollinators and animal friends. I'll talk a little bit about containers more too. Um, so one of the one of the products that I've been using a lot is um, and 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 Mimi talked about too is um, was these these native turfs that they're they're developing. So you can really get a fat a green you know, instead of just having gravel, you can have a, a green um, space against your home um, with these no mo fescue turfs. Um, this is one a combo I use. We you know it's that can, we can use a lot with the pebble and then the steel header and then a well hydrated um, fescue that you can let brown out kind of in the summer when we, we're not so like maybe June, July, you don't water and then you give it a little more irrigation to be more fire resistant as we head towards. So thinking about the cycle, like as we head towards the, like the more intense fire season. Um, another, take a trip to a materials yard. There's a bunch of them around and just walk around and look at, look at all the materials that you can use. Um, this is another native fescue from Delta Bluegrass um, called the native bent grass mix, which I'm finding is a lot more tolerant of sun. Um, our first talk together was up at the Bennett Ridge area that burned in 2017. Cindy, I'm sure you know that area. Um, and so I've, we've been doing a lot of work up there and the, the trees, so um, with the oaks kind of coming back and not coming back and there's, you know, it, there's, it's really a tough decision to uh, seeing the oaks, a lot of the trees um, that were damaged kind of failing now after a few years. We've been using a lot of this, this, this mix with this um, MP rotator system of low water use. Um, lower water use overhead drip that I'll talk about a little bit more overhead water. Cindy, I see you unmuted. Do you have something to say? Okay. Um, some other elements, um, some, some sites we've been using these cedar steps, but you can also use in the, in the zero to five, you can use um, uh, steel edging uh, steps with pebbles. Um, so another, you know, even taking it even further to not have to not have wood in that zero to five, zero to you know ten ish um, zone with stacked stone walls. Um, this was a good example of like a plus and a minus. This is in the it, obviously a Louis uh, project. Um, this was about a year and a half ago, and I'm going to bring this up a few times because you'll see the native landscape coming back in this space up on Mark West. So I, I like to show people how this was like, we started installing this landscape before the house was rebuilt. And you'll see in the background as I bring up this, this site, um, the oaks coming back and they're it's greening up in the background. So to hold out for your trees as long as you can. Um, like I said, we're losing a lot now, but it, but there's this regeneration happening with the, the acorns coming up under them. So they, these dying oaks from the fire have actually kind of been nursed trees to the new, new material coming up underneath. Um, so this is another area where this is an outdoor shower with this beautiful pebble and a lot of hardscape, but they have their barbecue right up against their house. So, you know, definitely during the red flag times that should get out of there, you know, the barrels should get out of that zone. But this is just a beautiful example of how you can have, you know, this is almost eight feet from the home and then this beautiful um, island of plant material. And then down below we have some, some wide paths. So there can be this transition out from the home that isn't as dark as you think it's gonna be. And we are continually maintaining this. Um, depending on the season. So a lot of these shrubs, even though they're native and we used to say, don't ever mess with them. We are, you know, more maintenance um, is happening in these places. Another nice entry, you know, this is in Fountain Grove, a rebuild um, concrete um, entryway with some flagstones, some well-maintained bunch grasses along the house. That's the red fescue, the same as the turf, but just as a, as a, a little four inch. Um, and then they, and she wants her, you know, people want their color, you know, and so these are some, some nice, you know, well-maintained containers where people can have, you know, a lot of 
of annuals and those fun plants that you just want to have and change out every season or whatever. So I'm not, I, I'm a little bit of a native plant zealot as my, my partners know, but I typically kind of push in the 80%, 20% zone. And I'm not going to deny people their, their pretty annuals and things like that. This is a just a fun way to look at it in a more modern perspective. And my friend at Native Valley Designs, nativevalleydesign.com, she's a lovely designer as well in Napa. And she's playing around with some some non, it's a it's um Carapia is a ground cover that also is the um, Delta blue grass that they have this um this not this little this turf that's kind of like I don't know. It's it's contentious if it's native or not native, but um, and then she used instead of doing um, like islands of plants, she did some more modern kind of clean like separations between the plants and keeping them well maintained. So this is kind of a fun way to use hardscape and some greenery against your house. And you'll see that she has about six inches of just um, some nice uh, crushed rock right against the building to keep it really clean. Another fun, um, nice way to treat the, the edge is using a very low ground cover that's really well um, hydrated called Diamondia that's not native with big flagstones. So you can you can have a more soft edge to your landscape um, without, you know, it doesn't have to be just rock. And this is a good one. I think this was good to talk about maintenance a little bit more because after, you know, since we put this in, you know, 2017, started doing rebuilds, then getting diving deep with this content with this group. Um, I look at these slides of what we put in, you know, three years ago, and I'm like, okay, on the left, this break in vegetation, obviously this is red fescue, but it needs to, before, um, you know, around August, these heads need to be cleaned up. So this is a good place for some maintenance happening. And then on the, the right, this is a dry creek that we did. And since then we've added, um, we've taken out any shrubs to the, to the left of the dry creek and just kept it very well maintained. And we added in all this pebble along the house that used to be mulch. So you can see where, you know, we're looking back on it and you know, we, we removed the mulch within that, that five foot and, um, it's been a really successful um, break in vegetation. Um, one key with all these dry creeks is to make sure you're you're really um, thinking about making sure they drain away from your home. So swales in that zero to five are just fine. But you just don't want to sink. You know, you don't want the, the the water to sink in right in that zero to five. You want it to keep moving along in that space. Whereas swales out in out in the the five to 30, you want them to sink in more. So this swale, both of these swales end up in a rain garden. So the water just flows down and ends up away from the foundation of the house. So this is where I want some firefighter um, feedback. So this was a residence that I gave some, so you can see the burn below. This was um, last year in Kincaid, right above the casino. And their house survived under these Giant beautiful oaks, um, and they did a lot of work underneath. They cleared they cleared out their um, leaf litter to two inches. They hydrated it before they evacuated, and the fire actually didn't. It died out right at their home, and and the oaks um, were really. I felt like they they um, helped with the embers, but I really do would love since we have you here, Cindy, to get your feedback on this photo. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I'm struggling a little at what I'm looking at, but from this, from this view right here, it looks like there's a lot of ladder fuels. So it looks like those trees are grown straight down to the ground that the, the, if you will, skirting of the trees has not been done. So, um, essentially, and, and I'm not, I'm not sure it's if you're up you. I know it's Cindy, it's a tough view. Actually, yeah. there's a big dip. I mean, we're kind of back in this. So when you get up close, sure. there really isn't, there's a lot of space in between those giant oaks over the house and those ladder fuel looking. And where, there. where is the house? Is this the house? Right under, no, it's right under that arrow. So under these giant oaks is the home that it yeah. was from 1940. So I just wondered about your feedback around um, well-established 100 year, 200 year oaks and homes underneath them. 
Well, I think again, like I talked about earlier, you know, um, oak and redwoods and some of our some of our more native trees are very fire resilient as long as they're mature and they're healthy, right? And so, and and if we give them a fighting chance of picking up those ladder fuels so that they're taking that minimal heat and that fire is not getting really seeded into that tree. So um, it, again, this is a really hard picture for me to make yeah, a no, really like, good I just, explanation I, I of. Say that this is like this house lives and I just said, like, since you're Yeah, here, I mean, if you would have asked me if I thought a house survived in there, I would say no, <laughs> just from this picture. But, um, you know, obviously it did, so. Um, I I have a, one theory on this. If we were to look at this a little bit more, if you look from the top, from going from the left to the right, you see a trail there and the fire edge comes up to there. So I'm gonna make an assumption that this fire was not necessarily in this area, a wind driven fire that was casting embers. Couple reasons. One, it stopped at that path. And two, this wooden barn down below did not burn. So it looks to me like it was maintained in the grass didn't get up in the ladder fuels as Chief Foreman was talking about. And I'm gonna to venture to say that the intensity in this area was not as other areas of the Kincaid fire. Cause if you look here into the left of it, you see that those oaks, the, can't, the green is still there and everything else that's not even right next to the house. That's my two cents. Yeah, perfect. Like they had really worked hard on, on the house really well maintained. And, April, I had a hard time hearing you. They they keep they kept that really well maintained. Like you said, that he was using his tractor to really keep that that fire break happening. So. Yeah, and you know, you look at that red barn there. That that looks like an older, you know, sort of weathered building. But you know, look what's adjacent to it. You've got a vineyard, and vineyards, frankly, make really good fire breaks. They just mm -hmm. do. They don't typically have a lot of if we'll go back to receptive fuel beds, right? And you've got, you know, some pretty mineral soil around that. And so, um, you know, that, that, that still standing is pretty impressive. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. I'm going to zip right through. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> so um, we're going to get into the 5 to 30. Um, we already talked about what that means, low growing, low fuel, rock mulch between plantings and well hydrated. So using really important to you, like use hardscape in between these masses of plants. Um, of course, using native plants, if you can, to, to help with biodiversity. Um, thinking about like, we, you know, we often talk about these large landscapes, but you can think about yourself in town in the urban environment, like with, with um, sidewalks and auto, you know, then being the, dip, the, the break between your neighbors, um, driveways, driveways and sidewalks and auto courts. Um, we think about, you know, that's a nice way to break things up. Um, here we use some low stone walls and that this is that same landscape um, and um, fruit trees in masses, but there's, they, there's these nice big breaks between those, those spaces. Um, these swales are used a lot as fire breaks and also as, as ways to sink in the, um, the water on, on site. So, the masses of plants can be broken up by pathways. They can be broken up by swales. Um, using rain gardens in the, art, in the garden, it's so wonderful to see water when it's raining. Um, and then these dry spaces are just more just hardscape in the landscape. Um, in the 30 to 100 space, um, so we just we just say more habitat, larger islands, and um, with shrubs between with with larger shrubs. This is where you can use your shrubs. Um, and in this space, you can start using arbor mulch in between the, the groupings versus just, um, just rock mulch. But this is that same site looking out onto the wooly, onto the burn side. And it's interesting to see, you know, six months to a year later, how fast these plants grow. So this is the California buckwheat. It's a wonderful habitat plant that can be cut right down to the ground. And it grew very quickly. And then to see the oaks coming back in the background and some of the plants that we put in um, with these, these buffers in between them. Um, some of the fun native plants, monkey flower and salvia out here in the 30 to 100. Um, what to use between the masses, we, we, in this, this 
30 to 100, you can use, um, I, I always recommend two inches or less of arbor mulch. Um, some, you know, mowed California native grasses, well -main or well-maintained ground cover in those spaces. Um, we, we don't really have time to get into a ton about irrigation, but but it was mentioned the kiss the kiss the ground the ground the documentary. So it even more made me want to, everybody to remember that the soil needs irrigation. It needs to be hydrated, and with drip only to the each individual plant. Unless you are you are um, using low water use overhead um, MP rotators like we're using a lot. Or a grid system of of irrigation, you're not you're not giving the plants and the soil what it needs to um, have the plants communicate the soil to do its thing. We really are just learning about how important this area is. Sorry, I have to rush a little bit. Um, so why use California native plants? I just thought if people wanted to get you know just put a few things in the chat that we can talk about after a few people. Anybody is a native plant person. Um, these are just some comments we got at past workshops that keeps local insects and animal populations thriving, reduces, reduces the need for water, bringing in other species potentially spreads exotic diseases, beauty, blooming season matches our climate, plus using natives gives another fun aspect, this is why I love natives, to gardening as a hobby. It also helps start conversations with neighbors and visitors about why native plants are important. Um, it's awesome, especially if you have native plants live here sign. I love the different layer that you get after you plant your plants. You get all the butterflies and bees and it's fuzzy in the afternoon. Um, so a couple of tips for successful habitat planting. Oh shoot, we're running low on time. Um, you know, use many types of flowers, long, large groupings in these islands, um, flowering at different times, plants that provide both nectar and pollen sources. We're going to have a lot of resources on our website, are on our website, and on the links for you to get a lot more information on this. I'm just going to run through quickly some of my favorite native plants that are really easy to use just to get started. The, the salvias, um, the sages, salvia species. Sonoma sage is a great one in the wooey. Um, it's a low-growing um, plant that it doesn't have a lot of fuel. It doesn't get so that it gets really woody. Um, ground cover, buckwheat, and California fuchsias. So this is where Mimi was talking about maintenance. So each, all these plants have different cultivars and, and different plants you can, different selections you can have. So you can get a, a California fuchsia or salvia that is a giant, or you can get one that's a little ground cover. So make sure when you buy your plants that you know um, the, the, hab the habit of the plant that you're using. Um, some more, you know, coyote brush and beadsless sage. Toyon is, an, is a plant that really came back right after the fires and um, can be cut back down to the ground and really come back vibrantly. So it shows like that, that kind of plant, that's the kind of plant you want in the wooey that you can cut down to the ground and it comes back really nice and lush. Um, coffee berries are a wonderful addition to your garden. I mean, they are buzzing like crazy in late August. It's overwhelmed with pollinators. So to take a breath, like this is, as a, as a California native plant designer, this is like my favorite combo. And we'll, we, will ha we will be publishing these, um, we will have these, these slides available to you all and a, a, a video you know on YouTube of our of this talk. But I have to say, after all these years, it's so fun to have so many people think natives are really hard to use or I don't know what to do. So I came up with this combo of this biodiversity island that can really work in most Sonoma County landscapes um, very wonderfully, unless it's in the shade. Like this is not a shady, shady landscape. And then why? This is my kiddo when he was little. Like we have to think about the future, and we have to consider the the that that balance between biodiversity and firewise and drought resistant, and and really think now is the time that our landscapes can really make a a, a wonderful difference, um, and really protect the firefighters, protect landscapes, 
you know, protect our pollinators. We can really think, like I said, from the systemic view, um, top down to really create landscapes that are resilient and valuable to our, our whole community. So thank you for letting me rush through my content. Um, and I'm excited for us all to take some questions. April, I, I have to say what I really appreciate about what this whole concept tonight has been about, and in particular, your journey through kind of those plants, if you will, is that I think that, you know, people think we're asking them to moonscape or nuke their properties, right? And that's not what this is about. We're not asking you to bring in, you know, 20 yards of rock and just make this look like the Arizona desert. That's really not the concept. And, and I just really appreciate your approach and, and even this, the whole approach tonight from, you know, we're not asking you to make your property look like the Sahara. We just really, there are really options to, to make your property beautiful and welcoming and habitat friendly and all of that. But, but also taking into fact and taking that responsibility of where we live and what we're up against here. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Cindy. I'm so, we're so glad to have you both along for the ride. Yeah, thank you to everybody who's on this panel. I really appreciate uh, you all being able to weave together uh, biodiversity, soil health, resilience, beauty, and all the different ways that we can create our defensible space. I think we easily could have spent one to two hours on each section of this yeah. webinar, uh, <laughs> but I really appreciate you narrowing it down in a digestible format as well. And for the audience, this is our time for question and answers now, um, but if anybody else had anything that they wanted to contribute and add after seeing all those presentations, this is our time for organic conversation question about what you would do in a really urban landscape where your only zone is that zero to 30 zone, or perhaps you have even less space in your front yard and what kind of design considerations you would take for that space? Uh, that's a great question. That question actually came up also on the Q&A section. I talked a little bit about that. I think what's what we're finding in the urban environment, the homes that we're usually responding to that are catching fire are the homes that have extreme clutter and um, people that struggle with letting things go. But what can we do and what can you do as a homeowner? Um, it's, it's just having a relationship with your neighbors. And some of the same principles do still apply as far as the zero to five foot zone, but why we lose those structures when we have a residential structure fire is in an urban area, a lot of times is because of the radiant heat and direct flame impingement. So it is a little bit harder to create that space, but that is a good question. But the same principles apply with ember casting and everything else. Having class A non-combustible siding is obviously going to help with direct flame impingement, making sure you have gutter guards, make sure you don't have pine needles and leaves up on your roof. And we always start on the roof and we work down to the foundation. So making sure we have a non-combustible roof, making sure that our vents are, are good, like we've talked about, the eighth inch mesh. And uh, we, we, I put some links to the FireSafe Marin site that has great information on where to get some of those vents. So, so those are some of the things that, that, that you can do in the urban interface to uh, help you um, if your neighbor's house is on fire. Well, and, and I just like to reinforce and um, uh, there are no guarantees. I think given our experience of what we've gone through here in Sonoma County in the last three years, we know that. But we also know that um, we can be our own best defense, but there are gonna be some scenarios where you do all the right things and you still may lose your home or you don't do all the right things and your home survives. Um, but that doesn't mean that we still shouldn't all be doing everything we can to be as prepared as we can. And uh, just to reinforce Chief Foreman's comment to, to make sure it's accessible and safe for our firefighters. Um, that is pretty clear. <laughs> They're gonna be like one of our most important resources every year moving ahead yeah. in the future. Um, yeah. I wanted to share, we, um, and, um, we shared a lot of information with you and I know it's like impossible to take notes on this and this has been recorded by Daily Acts and we'll um, give like a PDF version of all our slides and share that with Daily Acts who, who can share it with all the folks who um, RSVP'd for the workshop. So you've got that as a resource moving ahead. 
Yeah, you know, I think to tag on to what Jeff was talking about is that, and again, kind of a concept for the public is homes are fuel too. Um, that ember cast that we're seeing when these conflagrations happen and when these camp campaign fires happen, that ember cast is not just the vegetation. In fact, that ember cast is, is a lot of times the, the fire brands and debris from home to home ignition. And, and so as much as, you know, the vegetation is a huge component of that, um, homes are fueled too, especially, particularly in the wildland urban interface. So, um, you know, uh, uh, just a, a concept to throw out to the group is that um, while we are all so eggy about fire, it is, it is so the, the demon to us right now, we are a hundred years behind on prescribed burning in California a hundred years. We are never going to make that up in our lifetime. And I, and I can't remember who touched on, I think it was Ellie that touched on, um, you know, the, the acreage that we really need to burn to have a healthy environment, which they did, you know, in Native American times, right? Um, and we hit that four plus million acre mark this year. Um, and look, we're never going to make up for a, being 100 years behind on prescribed burning in any of our lifetimes, and probably in any of your children's lifetimes. But we have to start putting fire back into the environment. It is the solution. It is one of the solutions, right? As much as it is the thing that terrorizes all of our lives, we have to start changing our mindset that there are very healthy times of year that it is a very important tool for us to use. And I, as much as I don't wanna take anything away from people's trauma and, and angst about what fire does to us all, that is really one of the solutions to dealing with some of our issues here. And you know, there are, we have the option within our fire district and I'll just speak for ours alone um, in that we can get people burn permits that live in the wildland urban interface that are looking to do fuel reduction, fuel management on their properties, because a lot of people will say, I can't afford it. I can't afford to bring in a landscaper. I can't afford to bring in a tree company. I can't afford the dump fees to go and deal with all of this biohazard, biofuel, right? And so you can actually get a burn permit that, you know, essentially you get it from, you know, the, the we, we need rain, right? We need rain badly. But from the time that we actually move out of fire season and into winter, God willing that it ever comes. But once we get into winter, um, you've got the opportunity to do fuel management and mitigation on your property till April 30th by by burning and the and we're talking about manageable piles we're not talking about you know you know this massive pile the size of a house that somebody's going to light off but manageable piles to deal with for little to no cost let's put it this way if you're in the burn scar from anything from the nuns tubs kincaid glass gosh i just wish i didn't have to name off so many but if you're in the burn scar from any of these horrible conflagrations we've gone through in sonoma county you can get a burn permit, file your paperwork, and pay nothing, zero, to actually be able to burn that debris on your property in a safe and manageable way. Let me just say that. And be able to deal with that. You can also set yourself up every year. You may not get that all done. Make your piles for next year. That is a completely cost-neutral way to deal with and manage some of the fuels on your property. So I just want people to know if you are in the Sonoma County Fire District, if you live in the wildland urban interface and you are looking at trying to manage the fuels on your property um, and, and there's, there's, some, there's some things you have to meet to make that reasonable, right? But reach out to us. We wanna get you the option of being able to do a manageable debris burn on your property to deal with those fuels. I just want to say one thing, and this is off the topic, but we have some people that are still here. And I want to reiterate the importance of signing up for Nixle, signing up for SoCo Alert, knowing who your neighbors are, having a go bag, 
and having a pre-plan. Like I mentioned earlier, I would teach people and I still do on evacuations and being prepared. And when I found myself in that scenario, um, I was scrambled. So thanks to Cindy, you know, coming up and helping me. But if you're not pre-planned, it's not going to go like, like you want. And the most important thing at the end of the day is. Oh, uh -oh we froze up at the most important part. You froze, <laughs> or Jeff, I'm sorry. You froze just when you were sharing the most important thing. It was very. You froze up. You got to repeat oh, that, Jeff. Life. Lives are our animals and our people, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So there was, um, I know we're at eight o'clock, but um, do we have time for Jeff to maybe take the one last question about the ironwood suggestion Definitely. being coming in a form that would work as a good element in a fence where it touches the house? Ah, yeah. there's CCRs require wooden fences. And I think you need to get a fire official in to talk to your homeowners association about making sure that there's no wood fences attached to the house. But let yeah. me let Jeff answer the other question. So what was the question in particular? Uh, if ironwood that you suggested for decking comes in a form that would work as a good element in a yes. that touches yes. the house. Yes, yes, it is. Actually, people use it on sidings of homes and there's different dimensions. So the, the, the dimension typically for a deck is they call it a five quarter by maybe five and a half inch. So it's actually one inch thick material. They make it even thinner to do sidings on, on homes and, and it has a class A rating and, and that's the gold standard that we're looking for. So the answer to that question is yes. And it's a beautiful, um, sustainable wood uh, from Indonesia. And um, yeah. Just um, for clarification, it's I just made a deck with it. It's called Batu. B you, that's what you said. But it's uh, if you the the actual you know like sail name is B A T U, right? Correct. If you look for ironwood, I don't think you'll get Batu, or you might, but just know know that it's Batu. Right. Yeah. I want to thank you all for being here tonight, for sharing your knowledge, for sharing information in the chat. We really appreciate all of you taking time out of your, your evening to attend. And we hope you'll share this with other people too. And thank you, thank you, thank you to all of the panelists for being here, just your wisdom and everybody working together to share this is so valuable. Daily Axe is very honored to be able to be part of this as well. I don't know about you all, but I had my own notebook and was just scribbling notes <laughs> for what everybody was saying. I learned it a lot. I can't appreciate, I really appreciate this opportunity. So thank you all for coming tonight. And before everybody signs off, I did wanna let you know about some upcoming events that Daily Axe has. So let me just share my screen with y'all and tell you about some of those. We have a, oh, oh no. <laughs> we have oh, a, no. a landscape transformation that's coming up on November 7th, so next weekend, where we are going to take the first steps towards um, removing turf through a process called sheet mulching. And then we'll come back in the springtime and install a water-wise landscape and irrigation system. And then the following Saturday, we are going to be revitalizing one of our landscapes in Petaluma at the City Hall by doing more sheet mulching. These are going to be in-person events. We're limiting attendees to 10 people following all of the COVID best practices. And if you're interested in getting together and being part of a project, please uh, register on our website. Since we are only able to have 10 people, and we can't have as many walk-ins. We can't have walk-ins, so please do register on our website if you'd like to come to these events. And then lastly, just a huge, again, thank you to everyone for being here. I've included everybody's contact information. So if you have more questions, I'm sure everyone would welcome you to send them an email. And we are at our time. So we'll call it a night. Good night, everybody. Thank you again for attending. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you so Good much, everybody. Panelists who can join us, we have the debrief link in our emails and hopefully we can see you there. Thank you so much for everybody, everybody who was able to join us. Bye. Until next time. Bye. 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 Bye.